nonprofit organization called the Why on Earth Community, through which we're doing all kinds of innovative and collaborative work with partners uh, throughout the country and internationally. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm uh, just making sure everything's properly recording here. And uh, I wanted to pass out a few things that I'll be speaking about um, briefly in some cases, not so briefly in others. This is my new novel, Veriditas. And it's a story about biodynamics. It's a story about the healing of our world, the evolution of our consciousness. And it's a story that takes place for the most part in Colorado. And although it's, uh, uh, you might call it uh, visionary fiction or um, even potentially science fiction, we, we like to call it science reality. And it is a documentary. And so many of our friends who are here at the conference, including Brooke Levan and Stephanie Sizen, who are giving a talk at this time, are in the story, right? So it's a documentary featuring a wonderful uh, and extensive community of people and organizations that are engaged in this wonderful work. Um, and this book is called Why on Earth? Uh, the subtitle is Get Smarter, Feel Better, Heal the Planet. That's nonfiction, and in it we talk about many things, including finance, economics, and other macro systems, as well as health, soil, stewardship, and so on, um, and, and our own personal practices for prosperity, well-being, and uh, thriving. And then these are laminated one-pagers um, that are relevant to some of the uh, slides I'll be sharing with you guys. And so we can kind of like spread these out and sp pass them around as well. And if you wouldn't mind just helping me make sure that these get back at the end, I think there's six of those total. And so um, if that all sounds good, I can get started. Does that sound good for you guys? And uh, babe, do you mind just double checking that's recording okay? <clears throat> oh, this is my sweetheart, Caressa. Hello. Hello, sweetheart. Hello. <laughs> yes, babe, you're good. Looking good? All right. Yeah, so welcome. Um, we are living in such an extraordinary time, right? And uh, we're faced with so many uh, deep, uh, systemic, and, and often uh, profoundly historically rooted challenges on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have an amazing array of tools and capabilities at our fingertips and in our connections, in our communities. So it's quite a wild ride. With that in mind, I put together quite a wild presentation. And I, I would say maybe buckle up. Um, to use a, a, a phrase I know Brooke likes to use, Brooke Levan at Sustainable Settings. Um, and, and what I want to invite you to do here to kick things off, if you would like to, is uh, to close your eyes for a moment. And uh, maybe if, if you would like to tune into your body and your spine and your feet on the floor and your, your current connection, your vertical connection rooted in the, the below the earth, Mama Gaia, and expansively connected to the heavens above and the beyond. And I want to invite you to envision what a most beautiful, peaceful, healed, vibrant, near-term future can look like how it might feel and what sounds you might hear and what feelings you might be feeling. And I invite you to, 
take an especially deep breath, maybe the deepest in-breath you've taken so far today. And as my sweetheart Caressa would remind to do that deep inhale through the nose and if, if it's comfortable to exhale as well through the nose. Giving us a particular pranic charge, vital life force, inspiration as we commune with the photosynthesizers of the planet who exhale their oxygen that we inhale. And if you'd like, I'd invite you to come back into the room in a feeling of coherence with our group. And if you care to share any thought or feeling or vision or sound of a beautiful near-term future, I'd love to hear it if anybody cares to share. thriving people. So we're going to talk today about biodynamics and veriditas, the quintivium, and regenerative economics and finance. And do this in a vibratory tone that invites and acknowledges that there is a great healing underway in our world. A great healing that each of us is probably participating in. And that many of the folks gathered here at our conference are certainly participating in. And so this is an invitation and um, to add a little humor, in other words, what, what we're gonna ask is what the heck do gardening, accounting, and community leadership have to do with each other. Any ideas? Yeah, I see some smiles out there. Yeah, so we're, we're gonna talk about a kaleidoscope of themes and threads as we work our way toward some of the structures and strategies that we're exploring for regenerative economics and finance with our colleagues and collaborating partners. So, if it's okay with you guys, we'll, we'll take a bit of a, of a tour through a kaleidoscope of interconnected topics. And I think what we're gonna find is that at the root, at the heart of all of these topics, these seemingly disparate topics, we have core themes of relationship, respect, reverence, and reciprocity. And we view a big part of our mission at the Why on Earth community as doing our part to amplify and activate those tones, those modes of being, those ethical threads in our behaviors and in our communities, in our organizations, in our businesses. And that that is foundational to the regeneration renaissance. And uh, if, if we have any etymologists in the group today, you may notice that putting regeneration and renaissance together could be seen as a bit of a redundancy, uh, but we like it because we often find in resilient ecosystems, first of all, that there is redundancy. And secondly, because of the, the way these two terms, regeneration and renaissance, vibrate for us, have, are impregnated with meaning in our contemporary culture, we think they actually uh, belong together in a beautiful and coherent way. So biodynamics, right? Does everybody feel quite familiar with biodynamics in the room? Yes? No? Great. Okay. I, I love this gathering for this reason among many. We have so many 
deep expert uh, wizard-like practitioners in the biodynamic realm gathered. And we also have many of us who are newer to this party. And uh, it was not too many years ago that I was newer to this party. And I've since written about it and have taken a pretty deep dive into it. And I'm so thrilled that with friends like Lloyd, you may have seen Lloyd walking around. He, he's here at the conference and he lives here in Colorado. We have many folks who are now 100 years in to a profound and holistic form of land stewardship and land alchemy that was uh, initiated in a gesture from Rudolf Steiner. Uh, 100 year anniversary coming up in just a few months, right? So we've got this beautiful practice of stewarding soil and water, not just in mechanistic terms, uh, but in a profoundly, we could say spiritual, spiritual scientific manner of cultivating relationship, right? There's that relationship word with the myriad living creatures that make up the e ecosystems in which we're growing foods and medicines and relating with the critters and the water, the plants and the soil. So this is an earth alchemy of the highest degree. And uh, I'll tell you, there's, there's some booths here that uh, I really encourage you to check out if you're interested in diving deeper into this, especially our friends from Sustainable Settings who have a bunch of their wonderful preparations with them and many others. Um, and, and if you haven't had the opportunity to make the preparations uh, at a biodynamic farm, that experience of preparing different plants and animal uh, substances and burying them in the ground for many months at a time and then raising them back up out of the ground at an appropriate point in the year. This is a profound experience. I encourage you to find a biodynamic farm in your area where you can have this experience yourself. Right, Amy? Yes. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite biodynamic farms called Sustainable Settings, which is here in Colorado, just a few hours drive from where we are presently. Our good buddy Brooke is giving a talk presently. And um, at SUSTI, there have been many thousands of people trained and educated from the youngest early childhood uh, tykes to uh, adults of all ages. And uh, it's, it's been wonderful to observe and participate in many, many workshops over the years. I actually worked here uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, and so sustainablesettings.org is a, a wonderful uh, resource if you're interested in connecting in more. And Brooke here, you'll notice, uh, is a guest on our Why on Earth Community podcast series. Uh, one of our earliest episodes, episode three, we've published nearly 150 episodes now interviewing all manner of thought leaders, regenerative farmers, biodynamic practitioners, herbal medicine practitioners, indigenous wisdom keepers, youth activists, scientists, authors, all kinds of folks, organizational leaders, finance experts. So if you're interested in uh, getting connected to the, that resource, you can go to whyonearth.org um, slash community dash podcast and all the episodes are there for you. One of the things Rudolf Steiner was tapping into, tuning into, aware of, that, that really goes quite beyond our uh, ordinary organic agriculture and our ordinary regenerative agriculture and approach to addressing these interconnected challenges of uh, climate stabilization on the one hand, uh, biodiversity preservation on the other, enhanced health and nutrition on the other. Steiner has gone deeper than the mechanistic to understand that there's something subtler at play in our relationship with our soil, our food, our medicines, and that ultimately it ties right up to what's happening in our experience of reality, in our minds, our hearts, and even our willful expressions as human beings. And he, this is one of my favorite quotes from his agriculture lectures, and I'm wondering, would somebody care to read this out loud for the group? Does anybody li like to read out loud? Please, thank you. 
The most important thing is to make the benefits of our agricultural preparations available to the largest possible areas over the entire earth so that the earth may be healed and the nutritive quality of its produce improved in every respect. This is a problem of nutrition. Nutrition as it is today does not supply the strength necessary for manifesting the spirit in physical life. A bridge can no longer be built from thinking to will and action. Food plants no longer contain the forces people need for this. Thank you very much, Michelle. Yes. Thanks, Michelle, I appreciate that. Extraordinary that he articulated this 100 years ago, right? After the First World War, the Second World War hadn't even occurred yet. And already way back then, the munitions industry that really got scaled during the First World War had converted into agricultural chemical inputs. And farmers in the European region had asked Steiner to comment on what could be done about the reduction in vitality and healthfulness in the food coming from the farms that these farmers were already experiencing shortly after the First World War. So here we are, a century later, and I would, I would posit that uh, biodynamics is even more critical, even more essential now uh, than has ever been the case. Um, and why this is important for regenerative finance and economics we'll get to, and one of the reasons is the scaling up of those practices requires resources. And the appropriate allocation of resources in the global ecosystem of human activities that we call the economy is going to be better stewarded by people who have better health, nutrition, well-being, and mind, heart, will, connection, integration. So one of the themes running in Steiner's work, of course, is deeply influenced by the ancient hermetic knowledge and wisdom. As above, so below. As within, so without. And I think we'll find when we're talking about economics and finance, we're not going to take those topics in isolation, siloed from all of these other important themes and threads, because it's all interconnected. It's all one fabric that we're participating in. Indeed, interconnected fabrics are the, mm, what's the word? The mode of reality <laughs> that we live in. And not only do we find this in the neuronal networks of our own bodies, uh, the science coming from our space exploration and space imaging just in the last handful of years has revealed in an extraordinary manner that the distribution of matter in the cosmos follows the pattern of neuronal networks. And if you want to have a mind-blowing scientific white paper experience, check this one out called The Quantitative Comparison Between the Neuronal Network and the Cosmic Web by these two wonderful Italian scientists, Vaza and Filetti are their last names. Feel free to message me if you want. Uh, I have the PDF sitting on my desktop because I share this so frequently with people. Um, and, and this is laying out the science on the distribution of matter in space in three dimensions. Uh, and specifically dark matter, which is a strange name for something that basically means we don't understand it very well yet. That dark matter makes up about 86% of the total matter we're observing in space. And funny enough, it distributes in space in the same three-dimensional neuronal network patterns as water distributes in, in human brain tissue and let that sink in, right? Because when we're working with biodynamics, we work with water. And don't we work with structuring water? And don't we work with memory and water? And isn't memory somehow connected to intelligence? And don't these lovely scientists in their peer-reviewed articles say they must conclude that the cosmos is a neuronal network that is probably intelligent based on the data? <laughs> That's extraordinary. It doesn't even go down into the mycelial network. Oh. Oh, it's okay. Oh, my gosh. 
Amy, that's my next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Bingo. The soil. Uh, the incredible uh, neuronal network intelligence that is endemic to planet Earth. And I gotta say, I'm a huge fan of AI. Uh, authentic intelligence, AI, authentic intelligence, okay? And guess what, here on planet Earth, we, we have this authentic intelligence in droves, I think groves, we might think of groves of oak trees and other beautiful beings, but we have an incredible, complex, robust neural network of intelligence enveloping our planet, essentially. So, what the heck is this term Viriditas? Is anybody familiar? Hildegard, right? Yeah, thanks, yeah. absolutely. So Hildegard von Bingen, uh, medieval mystic, polymath, leader, uh, healer, author, composer, uh, and joyfully uh, potent uh, female, uh, champion of the divine feminine intelligence who uh, had no qualms about taking to task popes and kings and others who were entrenched in the patriarchal worldview. So Hildegard, an extraordinary, extraordinary leader, um, came up with this term, this Latin-inspired term veriditas, which essentially means the greening, the, the green healing energy of the divine that flows through plants, all plants. Um, nature's divine healing power marks the moment that God heals one through a living plant, the greening power of plant medicine. It's affiliated with vitality and fecundity and lushness and verdure and growth. And uh, this is a beautiful translation of a, of a little poetry from one of her uh, one of her works from the 12th century. And would somebody care to read this? Can you see it enough to read it? I'm wondering if Michelle can see it again. I can see it. Yeah, do you, would you like to read again? <laughs> Thank you. All the most honored bring the force, you who roots in the sun, you who lights up in shining serenity within a will that earthly excellence fails to comprehend. You are enfolded in the weaving of divine mysteries. You are redded. Is that redded? Redded, yeah. You are redded like the dawn, and you burn flame of the sun. Thank you. And yeah, the font's a little hidden in here with all the green. Thank you very much, Michelle. And, and keep in mind this sun to plant to earth to human connection. It'll, it'll come back up again in a few minutes. So, Hildegard, the Sybil of the Rhine. Uh, had such profound influence on uh, Francis of Assisi, on we think quite possibly Goethe, right? Mm -hmm. And the thread that comes into the modern era with Steiner and Jung and Hesse and Nietzsche and others. One of the podcast episodes we did more recently was with Matthew Fox. You may be familiar with this renegade theologian who was kicked out of the Roman Catholic Church for uh, affiliating too closely with indigenous Native American, I'm part Mohawk by the way, uh, and doing things like sweat lodges on his campus, right? And he's written, oh gosh, what is it, 40 some books. He's written three books just on Hildegard von Bingen. And in this podcast episode, we focused on this book in particular, A Saint for Our Times, Unleashing Her Power in the 21st Century. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out if you're, if you're interested. And this term Veriditas uh, is the title of the novel that uh, I wrote over the last six years, which just published about a year ago. And The Great Healing is Within Our Power is the subtitle. Um, I'll mention this at the end, but we are doing a book signing at the JPI bookstore right after this talk, if you care to get over there and check this book and some of the other books out. Uh, but this, this book explores these topics of economics and finance in the context of 
heart-centered connection with the living biosphere, with Mama Gaia, with the intelligence of the natural world. And I would posit that that direct connection is, is probably a requisite imperative for those of us especially working in the realm of finance, economics, and business. And guess what? I, I do a lot of complex financial modeling using tools like Excel. And these tools are very useful. But I haven't yet had much wisdom come out of Excel. We'll get knowledge, we'll get information, we'll get data for sure. But wisdom, I'm not so sure. I, I think we've got a severe shortage of wisdom actually in many of these disciplines in particular. And my sense is that wisdom's not just conceptual, it's embodied, right? And when we're, when we're at the farms, when we're working with the soil, when we're interacting with those microorganisms and other creatures, there's something happening in our embodied intelligence and wisdom. There's something that we're learning and experiencing that we're not gonna get probably from the digital realms. So in the book, <laughs> just to do a little uh, uh, announcement for the Colorado Tourism Board, um, there's a bunch of scenes that take place at these wonderful spots here in our dear state, including at some hot springs. This is very close to sustainable settings. And yes, this is a photo of my sweetheart, Caressa. Um, we knew we wouldn't run into copyright trouble if the photo was of her. Um, so so in, the, in the story, there are some really magical things that happen with, with the water, with Mama Gaia's water, uh, and the water of the woman who is the protagonist of the story. And she is an entrepreneur and computer scientist. So here's a few of the shots that uh, share where this adventure takes place, kicking off in Slovenia and then New York City and then uh, the Aspen Airport and Down Valley to sustainable settings and so on. So if you're interested in the economics, the finance, the computer science and the opportunity for healing by a deep connection with the living intelligence of Mother Earth, this story I think might be of interest to you. And it's loaded also with a plethora of indigenous wisdom and uh, ancient esoteric knowledge. Uh, including hermetic knowledge. Now, quintivium, who's heard of trivium and quadrivium? Familiar? Yeah. A ancient framework for education, seven subjects. Trivium is foundational. This is grammar, uh, logic, rhetoric, our ability to think and communicate in the symbolic structures of language. And then the upper four are number, geometry, music, and astronomy, right? The, pattern language of cosmology basically and harmonic vibratory frequencies that make up our reality so one of the things that gets played with in the intelligence of uh, this discussion is the idea that there's a another set of subjects being revealed now to humanity in this great dispensation that's coming through that is grounded in love, wisdom, kindness, and healing. So the quadrivium is an ancient thing, and Hildegard undoubtedly would have been aware of this. And we think of folks like Pythagoras, this goes way back to the ancient Greeks. The highest goal of music is not to connect one, is to connect one's soul to their divine nature, not entertainment, right? So, there's an invitation, and I think this resonates with the body of work from Steiner, that what we're doing is sacred. The way we're engaging in our relationships, in our listening, in our dancing, in our movement is sacred. And I'd ask you, you know, what song, what song are you singing? What song are you carrying with you day in and day out as you're, as you're doing the work that you're doing? So you can check more out about Vriditas, vriditasbook.com if you're interested. And um, one of the things I love about the story is, as I mentioned, there's a, a, a way in which it's a documentary about a number of extraordinary folks. And these folks who have been on our podcast, many of them are mentioned in the book as uh, cameo appearances. And also, uh, virtually all of them have influenced the story and the message in the book. So we've most recently had Jorge Fontana's, uh, the CEO of B Lab, 
USA Canada, right? You, you may be familiar with B certified companies. And this is stepping us toward the structures and strategies for regenerative economics and finance. Of course, our dear Sheila Foster here, the executive director of Biodynamic Demeter Alliance was recently on as well. And I was just at the Gutianum about, oh, I don't know, 10 days ago, uh, interviewing um, uh, Ueli and Jean-Michel, the gentlemen who co-lead the agriculture section for the Gertianum, the biodynamic section for the world. Of course, the 100-year anniversary coming up uh, is a very uh, momentous uh, occasion, and the February um, conference happening at the Gertianum in Switzerland uh, is going to be an extremely beautiful gathering, and so if you can make it over there, I encourage you to. Notice, notice the three key terms for the conference. Sun, earth, human, right? Doesn't that, doesn't that somehow echo what Hildegard had written? So the podcast, I wanna encourage you to check this out. Uh, we have so many wonderful luminaries and uh, uh, folks engaged in this great healing work. So here's more information about that that you can uh, access. We do video and audio. Uh, right, so all, all the episodes live on our website. You find video on YouTube, audio through Spotify, Apple, so on and so forth. So, what the heck is regenerative finance? Do you guys have any ideas? No? <laughs> I like that answer. Thoughts, concepts, notions, hopes, wishes, complaints? Yes? So, growing up, a barter and trade system. Um, we were farmers, so we take, you know, eggs to the local market and trade that for something that someone else had. And it didn't always require having cash, but you yeah. shared resources. And so whenever I think of regenerative finance, I always think of shared resources. Shared resources, absolutely beautiful. And one of the things we've seen, especially since the Second World War and accelerated through and after the 1980s is this hyper-financialization of all kinds of human interactions and relationships, right? So that the sharing of resources has taken a very different tone and feeling in many of our lives and communities as a result, right? Yeah, I love that, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it does because now that we have started to take away the cash and go to be paperless, mm -hmm. and every transaction is actually taking money off of that dollar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. more of a you know assault. You know, it's it's just it's mind boggling. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's you there's the tax on that dollar that you make. And right. Yeah. <laughs> Say, tax, say again. Right? And you already tax before you even get that dollar that you made. That's right. And most of us, you know, you yeah. tax before you get the dollar, and then you're taxed with your dollar. Yeah. You tax and then you tax on your car. car. Yeah. 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 You tax on what you bought. Yeah. With the tax money you're taxed. Well, meanwhile, the bank yeah. is, is making, you know, money on each one of those transactions. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You handed somebody the eggs or you handed them the cash. Yeah. You know, one dollar was one dollar, five eggs was whatever. There's a lot of skimming going on. It's mm -hmm. skimming. Yeah. Easy money. Yeah. And everybody's just so lethargic and lethargic and going to be What's the sustainable resource? Sorry? What's the sustainable resource yeah. that we can? Yeah, that's a good question. What do you think it is? For the sustainable resource? Mm -hmm. So I can eat. Yeah. That's my sustainability go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I have soil, I, I, I don't worry. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's been such a singular focus for finance on what is the return? What is the monetary return? Yeah. And when you bring in return finance, One of the 
things I love about the conversation around money and finance and economics is that it's a pretty complex subject. Uh, there's a lot going on. We have a lot of different experiences and attitudes and perceptions and beliefs and impacts, right, from how we're doing economics right now on the planet. I love this comment about soil too. In other talks I give, I, I often dive really deep into the human soil relationship. And it even shows up in our words, the word human and the word humus, for example. And in the creation story in the Hebrew, the creation of Adam or Adam from the Adama, the soil, the clay, right? I mean, it's, it's deep, deep, deep in our ancient traditions, this intimate connection between humans and soil. And my sense is that as we're witnessing and participating in this incredible regeneration renaissance, especially in agriculture, there's, there's a, a liberation getting underway that affects notions of security and freedom and health and wellness. And again, that mind, heart, will uh, integration. So we've got, we've got a lot at stake in all of this. Um, one of the other things I notice talking about finance, economics, money, currency, right? And people will say money and currency are actually two different things. Uh, they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, there, there's a lot of subtlety, there's a lot of nuance in these topics. And one of the things I'm thoroughly convinced of is that while we have a number of extraordinary folks working on these issues, nobody has all of the answers. At least I, if you guys know the person with all the answers, we'd love to podcast with that person. Um, please let us know. But uh, I, I don't know. We, we, we have had the opportunity to work and collaborate with so many amazing people and it seems nobody has all of the answers. Right now, one of our projects is a forthcoming book on regenerative finance, ecocene economics, stewardship philanthropy, service leadership, and social enterprise. And in this book, we have a number of these thought leaders contributing essays. And it makes for such a robust and rich conversation through many different threads and angles and views, right? For example, uh, Maria Rodell, some of you may know Maria, uh, she ran Rodell Publishing, right? And her grandfather um, founded the Rodell Institute, the oldest uh, organic agriculture research uh, nonprofit in the country, apparently. Well, in her essay, she comes out right away saying, we've heard about this invisible hand, right? Adam Smith's economic theory from The Wealth of Nations, published, what was it, about 1776 or something. She said, this invisible hand, I think we've got it all wrong. This isn't some supernatural force, you know, deus ex machina, God out of the machine. It's probably actually the work of women over the decades and the centuries. And, and by women, she means women and many others who have not been enfranchised in the same way historically in our economic systems. She said, did you know when Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations, he was living with his mother and she was cooking his food and doing his laundry? So there's the invisible hand for you. Okay, it's great. And, so, and, and she's an executive, right? And she, she, she's sophisticated when it comes to organizational leadership and, and competing in the modern economic uh, context. Uh, and so that's an example of one of the beautiful essays we have in the book. Yeah. When does that come out? Uh, this coming year, 2024. Uh, we don't have a, a date certain as of yet. In fact, we're still um, inviting a couple few uh, final uh, essay contributions because we want this to be as robust a resource as possible. Please. Well, there is a lot of dispute what Adam Smith really meant. Was he was he really a a, a total free marketer, or just a, he just was an anti-monopolist? Because some say he he basically 
was against the, you know, he favored public financing of, uh, of, of, of roads and, uh, and, and infrastructure. Yeah. And also, some say his uh, invisible hand was basically an, um, a societal war order. Yes. So, so there's, a, there's a dispute about uh, Adam Smith. Uh, thank you so much for saying this because it's really important and we don't want to pick on Adam Smith unfairly. And to your point, one of the other essays is written by Hunter Lovins, and some of you may be familiar with Hunter and her work. She's been on our podcast. We're actually podcasting again next week about COP. She's been at almost all of the COP meetings for the last several years. Her essay talks about the, it's called The Economics You Weren't Taught in School, something like that. Uh, and it talks about, Adam Smith was a moral philosopher. And there, there are a whole bunch of things pinned on Adam Smith that aren't, aren't his to, to own. Um, and, and she gets into some of that. And so thanks for pointing that out. Uh, it's a big discussion. But I think the way the invisible hand has been misappropriated and, and perhaps uh, misunderstood in modern times is, I think, what Maria Rodell is critiquing there. Yeah, and we've got, you know, John Fullerton, uh, Dr. Jandell Allen Davis, John Perkins, you may be familiar, wrote Confessions of an Economic Hitman and co-founded Pachamama Alliance. Kate Williams runs 1% for the planet. Um, Ruby Au uh, was the head of North America for Ecosia and has uh, moved on to other things now. So we've got just an incredible group of folks contributing to this project. And one of them is Tom Chi. And, uh, Tom has a venture capital firm called At One Ventures focused on regenerative technologies, and they're managing now about 450 million. Um, and one of the things he likes to remind us is that economics is not a science. I think this is one of the most important things for us to keep in the foreground of our minds when we're thinking about economics and finance. Economics is not a science. This past century has seen us behaving as if it's a science, and there's so much econometrics, there's so much in quantitative analysis. There was actually this specific transition from the, phys the mathematics of physics, and the economists said, we wanna, we wanna do that same thing, and it was brilliant, really. But it got us quite confused about what's going on with economics. In fact, economics is better understood as a design discipline like art or architecture. And so if, if there's something we're seeing in our current economic system and we don't like it, it doesn't mean that it's a law of nature at work. It means that some of us humans have created something that is creating impacts and outcomes in our world. Because it's a design system, we can change it. We can change the designs. And that's underway in a, in a big way right now, an imperative way. Of course, the other thing, I love etymology. I'm quite a nerd, if that's not already clear. Uh, the ec etymology of economics is this Greek oikos, right? That means home and implies community. So like back in ancient Greece, if I said, Amy, come on over for tea, come to my oikos, my, my abode, the front room of my abode would also be called the oikos where I would receive you and other guests in the community and we would hang out in relationship. So like implicit in this Greek term oikos is community and relationship. And it means home. Guess what other word comes from this oikos? Ecology, right? So economy and ecology have a common root in this Greek word for home. This is, I think, important for us to remember where this is all coming from and hopefully to help inform where this is headed. So now let's get a little bit uh, wonky about this. Who remembers in uh, modern standard economic theory the idea of the value chain and the four steps along the value chain from primary production to secondary manufacturing to tertiary services and the quaternary where all the grand wizardry occurs with the lawyers and the accountants and the data scientists, right? Is this sounding familiar? Okay. 
So this, this is a particularly linear and an extractive, often, way of understanding how an economic system works. And, and often in the conventional sense, what we're extracting from are people and planet, right? Where labor is one among many cost inputs into our profit making as we move through that process left to right, linear process. One of the things that we're discussing and introducing is this idea that we now have need for, and it's happening, a fifth node in this system of economic activity, which we're calling the quintenary. And this is the node of stewardship and regeneration. And we're seeing this already happening with thousands of businesses, small, medium, and large. We're seeing this with civic institutions. We're seeing this throughout organizations worldwide with positions like chief sustainability officers and myriad people at varying levels of leadership working to take better care of the people and the planetary ecosystems that are affected by and in which these activities are situated. So what that does is takes us from a linear extractive model where a very small percentage benefits from the value add over time to a circular, inclusive, interconnected model where this new point of intelligence understands fundamentally that taking care of people and planet is the objective, is the mission, is the requirement. Now, quintenary means five, right? I don't, I don't think it's an accident. I tend to like to think in symbolic terms. There's something very special about this number five. Now we're going in this kaleidoscope. We're running down a little rabbit hole. This is a little side note to our economics. In the cosmos, as far as we've been able to tell, when we're looking at how atoms are arranged in molecular structures, we do not see atoms arranged in five-fold patterns unless we're looking at life. So the inorganic atomic structures that we see in things like quartz crystal or uh, elemental metals or whatever it might be are arranged in patterns of two and three and their multiples, right? So two, three, six, eight, nine, and so forth. Only in life, in DNA, in organic living material or material that once was living, do we find the pentalpha or pentagonal uh, geometric structure. That's pretty extraordinary. And one step further, just to run even deeper into this hermetic rabbit hole uh, in the spirit of Rudolf Steiner's brilliance, we find in the heavens, in this relationship with Venus, a particular phenomenon where our Earth and Venus and Sun align every eight years in a pattern that is a five-pointed uh, star or rose. Curiously, if you're familiar with the Fibonacci series, one, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, and so on. In eight Earth years, Venus goes around the sun 13 times, and we align five times at 72 degree intervals, forming this geometry. So the geometry of five is, is really significant. And in the esoteric uh, story of the building of King Solomon's temple, there's some beautiful stuff going on with patterns of fives and sixes combined, which we also see in the DNA structure. Uh, we know Steiner wrote on this quite a bit, and so if, if that's a rabbit hole you'd like to go down, we can maybe talk more together after. So the number five might be really important. As we're thinking about ecosystems and relationship and interconnectivity, one of the things we're seeing emerge in these structures, influenced by the quintenary stewardship and regenerative imperative, is that we have opportunities for social enterprises to generate revenues and profits and to more liberally share 
portions of those revenues and profits with our nonprofit structures, our NGOs that are doing social and environmental work all around the world. And this is exactly what Kate Williams and her team at 1% for the Planet are doing. And, and they are approaching $500 million in donations from some 8,000 companies participating to around four to 5,000 NGOs receiving. And she told me recently they're expecting to hit a billion within the next three years because of the growth that they're seeing. So it's probably just a couple years before we're at 10,000 companies, for-profit companies who are deliberately talk about skimming. There's a good kind of skimming here going on. Deliberately donating 1% of the top line, not the profits, the top line to these NGOs that are doing this important work, serving people, serving our planet, not out of a profit motive impulse, but out of a service impulse. That's one of the patterns that we're taking a very deep dive into in this work that we're doing. And we're seeing opportunities for funds, foundations, and family offices, that's what the triple F's are you see here, to participate in many of these kinds of organizational structures. And we're innovating hybrids that are social enterprise, cooperative in some ways, but also traditional for-profit in some ways for investors as well so that the economic benefits are shared more broadly among multiple stakeholder groups. And I, I just want to talk about this for a moment because this is really important. It's probably really obvious, but I think it's important to keep front of mind. In our economy, there's this feedback loop, right? Those companies and their leaders who have aggregated the most capital generally have outsized impact on policy and on the public narrative, the perception of reality, right? We call it advertising and lobbying. And because of those impacts, the rules of the game are influenced, right? And so you get, you get these feedback loops that can be negative or positive depending on what's going on with the consciousness of the folks who are participating in those systems. So similarly, in terms of public awareness, in terms of education and storytelling, in terms of what we believe to be possible, as more and more of these beautiful, regenerative and stewardship-oriented companies are generating more and more revenues and profits, we're seeing more and more storytelling, conversation and education in the public arena that is helping shift what we expect that is helping to transform what we believe is possible. My sense is this is just about to do one of these. And it, what, thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness, because by golly, we've got so much work to do. And one of the things that we can do with these flywheels is mobilize millions and millions and millions of people worldwide around these possibilities. And, with these kinds of companies, their products and services. And look, I'm not naive. I'm not saying everybody's perfect. I'm not saying every company in the 1% ecosystem or every B certified company is as good as it might be three years from now, right? But part of what's happening in this dynamic is instead of a race to the bottom, we're seeing a beautiful dance to the top. Yeah. And we're learning from each other. And we're seeing as best practices continue to develop and evolve, by golly, we're gonna benefit increasingly by uh, adopting those and embodying those in our organizations. So as these companies continue growing, as these companies continue competing in the marketplace, we are seeing enhanced wellness and regeneration as a result as well. These are virtuous cycles we get to be a part of and we get to help amplify. So one of the things we're doing in the book is a number of case study vignettes. Short and sweet, these aren't, these aren't Harvard case studies. These are snapshots of some of the best models that are already uh, at scale, that are already demonstrating the impacts and the effects. Some of them quite old in modern economic terms. For example, the Mondragon cooperatives. 
in the Basque country in Spain, uh, founded in the 1950s, have 90,000 worker owner members across 80 autonomous, independently managed worker owned cooperatives, generating in the aggregate somewhere around 11 to 12 billion euros per year competing in the global marketplace. I was just there a few weeks ago and we podcasted with Ander Ichibera Otodui, not easy for me to say, um, and that podcast is next up to publish, so keep an eye out for that one. And he's the liaison to the world on behalf of the Mondragon corporate system, explaining the incredible uh, things that they're doing at scale. Worker-owned cooperatives, so instead of capital being in the center of the decision making, people are in the center. And the cultural experience there, you talk about the sharing and reciprocity. Ander invited me on Friday evening to go with his friends on the town and they have this tradition of the progressive party. Hemingway spent a lot of time in this region and you may recall in some of Hemingway's literature talking about these progressive parties. He, he drank a few, I don't drink anymore, but there's this, you're out in the community with everybody and here comes the CEO of a billion dollar company. You would have no idea if I didn't have Ander in my ear saying that's the CEO. Everybody's on the level. Everybody, this was the poorest region in Spain in the 1950s. An ethnic minority indigenous group that was treated horribly under the uh, Franco fascist regime. It is now the most affluent region in Spain. But you don't see these mega yachts, you don't see these super mansions, you see people in the middle class. And similarly, nor do you see ghettos and abject poverty. Folks are in the middle. They've instituted things like executive pay cap uh, differential limits. They're around six or seven to one, meaning if the lowest paid, fully vested, full-time employee gets $50,000 a year or euros, the highest paid executive in the entire system is getting 350,000. You know, contrast that here in the United States. The, there's been a lot in the press in the last two months around the big automakers, right? And you may recall, those executives are making somewhere around, what is it, two or 300 X? Yeah, wow, no wonder. <laughs> no wonder, no wonder, no wonder we have people in this country moving through public spaces requiring bodyguards. I asked Ander, I said, do, you, do, do any of these people need bodyguards? He said, bodyguards, what are you talking about? We're all friends. We all live in community together. There's no bodyguards. <laughs> all right. So, lots of amazing GLS Bank in Germany, very in, influenced by the bio, biodynamic and, and Steiner anthroposophical work. Yes? So Taos is on here for three reasons. I love to ski, I love Taos, and they're B certified. Okay, and we're really interested in learning what that means for them as a ski resort. We're really interested in the winter tourism arena because they as an industry are sort of on the front lines in terms of potential impacts from climate change and the ways that they're adapting, whether it's Vail Resorts or Aspen Ski Company or Towers or what have you, um, is quite interesting. So that's, that's why they're on the list. Okay, so are they, they're interested in interview with Aiden and Norwegian? Not Norwegian? yet, we would like to connect. Do you know them? Uh, yeah. That'd be great, yeah, it'd be fun. We've, we've got um, our uh, substantial research on virtually all of these so far, but uh, there are a couple that we're still putting together, so that would be actually really helpful. Uh, thank you. Any other questions on this? Any other, and, and also if you say, gosh, there's this one company in Malaysia or something that ought to be included, we'd love to hear that too, right? Because this is by no means an exhaustive list, it's more of an indicative list. And the point is to see the emerging patterns of uh, shared equity and resources of new methods for governance, 
uh, and general social and environmental responsibility, stewardship and regeneration through companies, right, and organizations. So if you have suggestions, we're wide open. Well, I know that I was with uh, Dr. Rona when you were talking about the one in six. Oh, they're here. Oh, they are? Oh, yeah. I'm blind. Yeah. So I was just thinking when you were talking about the one well, in six, I remember him talking about that. Absolutely. The same, the same way. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Totally, Amy. Yeah. And, and they're, the name is really small in their, the logo there that they is. shared with us. But yeah, they're awesome. And we've had the opportunity to interview three or four of the executives from Dr. Bronner's on different podcast episodes. And there will be another one coming out in a few months. So um, yeah, thanks. Not only soap, but now chocolate. Yeah. So one of the other things that we're working on with a global consortium right now for a project that's underway that um, we'd love to connect and collaborate on if you have uh, resources or relationships that can be helpful um, is looking at a global digital platform to do uh, e-commerce and social media in a very different way. Imagine social media with kindness and reciprocity and decency, right? Imagine what's possible. We've, we've just started with some of these tools. My sense is as we're moving forward in this era, we're gonna see these tools get deployed for much more positive impact and outcome. And, and we're, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of step away from the adolescent frat boy way of doing business. It just doesn't make sense. It's not appropriate. I've got two adult children, right? So I can think a little bit liberally about what this all means, but there are certain things we probably shouldn't be asked to be responsible for when we're adolescents. And we probably will be better off, globally speaking, if those archetypes aren't the ones uh, at the center of the power structures any longer. So what we're looking at are hybridized, shared ways of governance among multiple stakeholders. The equity breakdown that we're looking at for this particular project includes investors, yes, but they're one of five capital classes. There's some really interesting things we can do with uh, tax write-off benefits to boost the financial value back to those investors. But fundamentally, one of the things we're also seeing in all of this is an evolution around the consciousness and thinking of investors and philanthropists, looking for blended returns that, yes, include financial and also various forms of impact and other benefits that are not necessarily quote unquote financial. So there's some very sophisticated thinking among the group on how we can leverage where we are today to help bring us to a near term future that works way better for all of us. <laughs> In our governance, we envision a three part council system where one board of trustees, two is a stewardship council. Any of us can be on those as a matter of merit, appropriate merit. The third is the Sophia Wisdom and Grandmothers Council. I can't be on that one. I happen to be part Mohawk. I think I mentioned that before we started recording. And in that tradition, among the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois people, there's a great tradition of the Grandmother's Council, the women. And you get a lot of really amazing chiefs, a lot of gung-ho guys, and they are beholden to the Grandmother's Council, to the women. And Ben Franklin actually spent a lot of time with the Mohawk people in the Iroquois Confederacy broadly. And some of the learnings influenced the structure of the Constitution of the United States, including the war powers dynamic coming from Congress, right? The president cannot go to war on his or her own accord. There's a check and a balance there, theoretically. <laughs> right, and, and similarly in this ancient tradition, it's only with the grandmother's consent that war <coughs> can happen. And apparently there are times when it's deemed that that needs to happen. Maybe in our future that doesn't need to happen either. We'll see. 
So this is a mechanism that we're cultivating through the Wine Earth community. And we already have a number of extraordinary women, two in this room, who are part of the early steps and stages of this work, right? So Amy and Caressa, maybe you can raise your hands. Thank you. Yeah, and we're connected to a number of indigenous elder grandmothers as well and doing a lot to bring more cohesion into that as well. So this is the project I mentioned called Ecoscene, the digital project. If you're interested in it, if you think you have resources and relationships that can be helpful to this effort among a global consortium of companies and thought leaders and organizations, please let us know because we are, uh, we are having a lot of fun uh, co-creating and developing this right now. So is it Echoscene with an S? Yeah, so Echo C, okay. We didn't talk about it, so we got the oikos, the echo, the economy, the ecology, and then um, probably a lot of us are familiar with this idea of the Anthropocene, uh, the era we're living in, in which human activity on the planet has such impact, it's of geologic proportion, right? The Anthropocene. Now, some of us are thinking that the next step, if we're able to uh, embody this healing work appropriately, and this regenerative and stewardship and kindness and love and wellness appropriately, we have the opportunity to step into the echo scene. E-C-O-C-E-N-E, -E -E, echo scene. This is a play on words with a scene like a scene, like a social scene, like a place of connection and like a scene in a play, which is from the Greek skena, which used to be the ritual ceremonial threshing floor for the harvest. As a community, we worked our food together and that grew into theater. Interesting, right? Anyway, that's, that's the idea. And if you're interested in any of this, I would be happy to share our uh, strategic vision document with you, looking out over the next five years. So, because why? What's the big deal? I know I probably don't have to convince anybody in here, but imagine um, we're all on a boat together. And, and who was it recently who said, you know, sometimes we say we're all in the same boat? Mm -hmm. And I forget who it was, but there's a really important comment. And she said, we're not all in the same boat. Some of us are in yachts, some of us are in rowboats, and some of us are drowning in the world right now. So that, that's probably the more appropriate way to think about all of this. That said, this cute little meme for, you know, uh, theatrical effect with a little humor is illustrating that one boat is in the process of sinking at one end and you got a couple chaps at the other end saying, sure glad the hole's not at our end, right? Come on. <laughs> like, we are all in this together on planet Earth. Um, and this is a uh, global wealth pyramid um, showing the distribution of uh, people according to income and wealth. And you know, we don't need to go into all the details. I can come back to this later in a question and answer if you like, but suffice it to say, we have a massive co hyper concentration of wealth among an extremely small percentage of our global population. If you were to observe that in terms of ecosystem dynamics and how ecosystems tend to distribute resources, you would say that's, that's an ecosystem in the process of failing, right? And so we fundamentally have a choice in all of this. This is one of my faves about food. And we were talking, uh, Dylan and I, about food hubs. Dylan's running a food hub. I used to. And uh, I used to say to a lot of our ag partners around the state of Colorado, and you know, I lived and worked in Boulder, Colorado at the time, which has some stigma. You might be surprised to hear this. The liberal bubble of Boulder. And sometimes I'd apologize to some of our rural ag partners that I'm from Boulder. Anyway, I, I often would say, look, call me strange and, and maybe wacko and maybe extremist, but if somebody had to wear a hazmat suit uh, to process you know, some berries or some produce a few days ago, like I, I don't think I ought to give that to my kids right now. Like I, I know it's pretty wild and out there. So, you know, this, this is the reality that we're dealing with right now. And this is, this is the 
visual and symbolic representation of the of the choices we have in front of us and i am so excited to know that we see emergent we see scaling up we see proven so many structures and strategies and models that are working and working better for us and working better for our world this isn't theoretical this isn't hope i love how hunter lovin says hope is not a strategy this is real, this is pragmatic, and this is happening now. My sense is our task is to cultivate our communities with even more vigor, our knowledge, our relationship, and our resource sharing with even more joy and energy to learn about what's happening and what's working with even more deliberate curiosity and expedited inquiry and to drop into a deeper sense of love and kindness and coherence in our hearts as our minds are evolving around what's possible. And I want to emphasize as I wrap this up that in addition to the many structures and strategies we can talk about, and we just kind of had the opportunity to skim the surface a bit today, I think there's probably one foundational thing that is absolutely necessary and that is not an intellectual matter. It is actually a matter of the heart. And I think this is part of the genius and wisdom of Steiner's teachings. If we're able, as we're able, to practice and play together, coming into heart coherence, coming from a place of love and safety and security, and not from a place of stress and fear, and anger, we are creating vibrationally the conditions for the near-term future we want to see playing out through our structures, our organizations, our strategies. This is imperative, and we're doing beautiful work with the Le Ciel Foundation, a huge shout out to our friends there, around the cultivation of the heart coherence in councils, in groups, people coming together, entrepreneurs, organizational leaders, philanthropists, financiers, coming into coherence first, getting good at maintaining coherence, and from that place, deploying capital, creating, scaling up these projects and solutions. Which allows us to, again in the kaleidoscope here, uh, call in the energy of Raphael, the healer, Raphaela in the Islamic world, Israfel in the Islamic world, healing apothecaries, marriages, lovers, travelers, shepherds. These are such good things. Happy meetings, pilgrims, new business ventures. Look at that. Writing, purification, music, caduceus. These are all affiliated with the archetype of the Raphael archangel. Curiously, Raphael is also connected to Hermes, Thoth, and Mercury in the various uh, cultural traditions. This shows up in a beautiful way in the realm of biodynamics, doesn't it? When we have our preparations mapping to their planetary and plant affiliations that is you know, beautifully uh, represented on the Kabbalistic tree of life. Some of these pathways, for example, sun to mercury to earth, uh, the green path and the rose quartz path of sun to Venus to earth are uh, variations on the 501 preparations that many of us have been playing with here in Colorado and elsewhere. So if we want to dive deep into that, and also there's some discussion of that in the book. I want to invite you to our new Holistic Healing and Herbal Resources Guild. And Amy and Caressa have been a big part of our uh, preliminary work on this over the last few months, preparing it to soft launch uh, with our community here today. This is a community of holistic and herbal medicine practitioners and product offerings that get on a public map with a directory so the public can more easily find these products and services and so that we can uh, more joyfully and playfully uh, build community together. This is one of the important elements of this broader picture. I want to invite you, if you're interested, to join our ambassador network. This is Gawenny Jock, an amazing uh, Mohawk leader I mentioned last night in our gathering who was a guest at our monthly meetup on Sunday. We do a 
once a month Zoom meetup, 11.33 a.m. Mountain Time. People joining usually from Kyrgyzstan to the West Coast to places in Europe and the East Coast and Midwest and Rocky Mountains. And in our ambassador framework, we have a lot of different ways for people to plug in from biodynamics and soil stewardship and permaculture to our global advisory board, our herbal uh, resource holistic healers guild, our grandmother's council and Sophia wisdom council. So really invite you to join with us on that if you're interested. And one of our new projects that I'm really excited about is an art and beauty project we're doing with some of the artists in our network. Tomorrow at the showcase, we're gonna have some art on display. Um, and Verona, our friend who painted these, uh, will be here with some of her art. And I painted these and I think we'll probably have those on display too if, if there's room. And then finally, one of our social enterprises that is very much about enhanced health and wellness is the Wele Water Soaking Salts. And these are biodynamically and regeneratively uh, grown hemp infused aromatherapy soaking salts. So we're getting hemp from places like Sustainable Settings and some of the other regenerative and biodynamic farms in the Colorado area. With these beautiful salts to soak in your bathtub. We, you hear, hear farm to table, right? You know farm to table? We, we like to say farm to spa or farm to tub. Um, so yeah, we'll have uh, a bunch of these available at the showcase tomorrow too, if you want to stop by. And I wanted to mention too that we are uh, launching this winter our uh, Simple Gardening Wisdom video course to help the general public uh, do more gardening and soil stewardship and biodynamics and permaculture in their own yards, neighborhoods, communities, and to help get over some of the inertia hurdles and the intimidation hurdles, right? Because some of this gets really wonky really fast, especially with the burgeoning of soil science that has come out in the last 10 to 15 years. Easy to get over well, but this is uh, meant to keep it really fun and simple. So this is available. Is that for uh, more of a like, specific ecosystem or place? Or a lot of the strategies are, are good generally for uh, the temperate, you know, it's not so tropical, but the broad, uh, many growing zones of temperate. It's meant to be introductory and not like, here's the zone five, exactly what you should do. Yeah, but we share some resources for folks that want to go in those deeper practices as well. And is that only available on the website? Through whyonearth.org, yeah. yeah, on the website, thanks. So all these books we have at the signing coming right up. Um, I encourage you to enjoy them. We have a series of children's books as well with lots of activities for parents and grandparents and educators. And um, with that, I wanna also just say that this topic of finance, economics, currency, my, I didn't get into some of the complementary currency stuff that we're doing a la Bernard Lietaire um, through these projects, but would be happy to chat with you guys uh, after offline and to collaborate, especially if uh, this is of interest to you. And again, if you have relationships and resources that you think would be additive to these efforts. And a big part of what's happening with the Wild Earth community is that we're like a neuronal network. This is actually in our business plan. Uh, we're connected increasingly with <coughs> community leaders and organizational leaders and thought leaders who are innovating uh, right now on all of those fronts. So with that, I thank you guys so much for uh, gathering today. And uh, if there are any questions, I know we just have a couple minutes remaining. I just want to say this was a dynamic Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. And, and, and look, a lot of these topics cannot be addressed uh, comprehensively in the course of 
an hour or two or a day or two. And, and I invite the deeper connection and conversation because these things we're working on are months and years and maybe even lifetimes of unfolding. And uh, we have a lot more in the way of resources to share also. So thank you. Any others? Yes. I one time read that there's, there's a rare species agriculture center in North Carolina for state poultry. I don't know. I, 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 they, I, I think they never participate in either here or Acres uh, events. They're trying to preserve her because I know most of your your, your, your your stuff that you buy in the farm and poultry is really from a few species. Interesting. Yeah. I'm not familiar with that group. I don't, I don't have the name here. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I have one more question. Yeah. I saw those children's groups yesterday on the thing, and I was just so. That, that, these are the only groups that stood out to me. Oh my gosh. For you because of the illustrations. Yes. I didn't flip through the books, but I made a mental note that I wanted to order them, and I didn't realize it was going to be in your session. <laughs> This makes me so happy to share with our dear friend Yvonne Kozlina, who's the artist that we collaborate with on these books. She's amazing. And not only do we have the books available at our showcase tomorrow, we'll have some prints of the artwork from the books. Because inside the books there are a bunch of amazing paintings that she's done. And uh, so yeah, that's uh, thank you for that. That's so great. It makes me really happy. It's, it's such a joy collaborating with her, and she's such an amazing yeah, artist. So yeah. yeah, the next one we're working on is called Celebrating Trees, right? So the ethnicity of brother and sister is different in each book. And in Celebrating Trees, they're Mohawk, brother and sister. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a joy. And her artwork, when we get to see the, the new pieces, it's a lot of fun. Huh, babe? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Because she's just such a sweet woman. Yeah. Well, any anything further, or should we should we wrap it up? I it almost looks like a question. A lot to digest. <laughs> yeah. That's the kaleidoscope. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and very like I said. I know. I know yeah. you're seeing them up close, and sometimes it's easy to forget about the distance. Yeah, thanks That's my feedback. for that feedback. We are we are used to having bigger <laughs> screens than we have here today, yeah. so thank you. Um, it's, I agree. That contrast. I'm a graphic designer, too, so. Yeah. Like, it's like the thing that's like pushing me. <laughs> yeah. I, I, ought to, I should have invited everybody to uh, sit closer I mean, to you. But thank you. Yeah. Oh yeah, appreciate that. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, take care. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think one way we know there's a class difference now is. That the people uh, 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 don't even fly the regular airlines. Anymore. That's right. Yeah. The private jet, that's a new for now. Uh, I know. That is so true. Yeah. 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 They don't have to go through the airline account. Yeah. When I got in that car accident, I didn't think I could.